Welcome everybody to a, another uh, seminar webinar in the uh, Five Stone Buildings uh, sessions in this uh, COVID-19 world. For those of us who are not uh, by the seaside, I have uh, put uh, behind us uh, uh, a few uh, pictures of uh, seaside, uh, just hoping uh, that that raises uh, your spirits uh, for now. And uh, I just really want to introduce what we're going to think about uh, in a uh, quiet moment for the purposes of the webinar today. And that is the really unenviable position of uh, practitioners in relation to uh, the situation of undue influence and lifetime uh, gifts, uh, an area where maybe it's the conveyancing solicitor who bears uh, the brunt of having to give the information uh, and perhaps an area that the private client team need to ensure uh, that they have uh, discussed uh, with their uh, conveyancing department on a regular basis. So uh, those of you uh, who've been to any of the earlier webinars may well know that what we are doing in this today is uh, I am speaking to you live now uh, and thereafter this webinar will however uh, then be available uh, to view on the Five Stone Buildings uh, website. Uh, we also um, have a facility whereby uh, if there are any uh, pressing questions that you want to ask at the end that I may be able to address to everybody then please feel free uh, to use that uh, Q&A uh, element which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, in the alternative uh, of course um, I'll be uh, happy uh, to answer anything via uh, an email if it's of a less uh, practical nature, as it were, that's applicable to the, everything we're talking about, but you uh, want a bit of a pointer in relation to it. Uh, so on that basis now, uh, on now that we've reached just after uh, 12 o'clock, um, I'm uh, going to start, if I may. So Joe, could you take that? So Catherine, it is today, is going to take us to our first slide. Uh, thank you very much. So we've already talked about in the introduction uh, about uh, the focus of our seminar. Uh, what I also just wanted to identify in this slide, if I may, is that there has been a flurry of guidance notes activity uh, that have been updated uh, by the Law Society, either at the end of the 2019 or indeed um, in this summer. Uh, and I think in reality, uh, given uh, the financial circumstances of what we now face in terms of the fallout, uh, the reality is that there may well be those uh, amongst the practitioners who are going to see more of the presence of undue influence. So I want to make sure that everybody's aware uh, of where to find uh, those guidance notes. Uh, so Catherine, if we could then move to the next uh, slide. This is really just to contrast uh, what was felt to be uh, the type of relationship that gave rise to undue influence in the 19th century, uh, the well-known seminal case of Alucard, of Alucard and Skinner uh, relating to uh, a novitiate uh, nun uh, who wished to uh, reclaim her property um, after she'd lost her vocation. Uh, and of course, at that stage, therefore, what was being looked at uh, was the relations between the donor and the donee at the time of the execution of uh, the gift. Uh, there, the spiritual fervour gave rise to a presumption. Uh, so, Joe, jo, uh, Catherine, if we may move to the next uh, slide. Uh, so, you can see that there it's going to be set aside the gift unless it was a spontaneous act of the donor acting under circumstances which enabled him, her, in those circumstances to exercise an independent will. Um, Catherine, we're then going to just turn to these uh, situation of now what might be presumed undue influence in the 21st century and the public policy reasons and the circumstances in where we might find it and in essence I find this a really rather uh, depressing uh, position as it is outlined by uh, Lord Justice Mummery in the Nyman's uh, case uh, because the reality there what he identifies and one which I think we find in our day-to-day -day practice is that the type of relationship and the type of pressure uh, that may be placed upon the vulnerable comes often uh, from those who expect to inherit but would rather wish to perhaps accelerate the receipt of their inheritance prior to the death uh, of uh, their parents or relatives or potential uh, 
testators who they felt uh, owed them a, a moral obligation uh, to leave them their uh, funds. So if we can now, Catherine, turn to the next uh, slide, just to remind ourselves of these very basic principles, what one still has to think about is, of course, there is just one principle of undue influence, but that that can be proved by these two different methods. That is the direct proof of actual undue influence, uh, much more difficult to find because of its nature, uh, the influence uh, might be covert. And then the second, the circumstances that we know can give rise to presumed undue influence arising out of the relationship between the two people, uh, a measure of influence or where you have a particularly vulnerable individual. So turning, if we may, to the next slide, how then do we prove our presumed undue influence. There are the two uh, elements for this evidential presumption to apply, uh, the proof that we've identified about the trust and confidence of the relationship and the transaction that calls for an explanation. So turning to where we might find that in the next slide. So what we're looking at for this presumption to apply it is simply a forensic tool in the absence of there being direct uh, the direct evidence. We still have the complainant still bears the burden of proving uh, the trust and confidence existed. Often it is in the management of financial affairs, but it can be wider uh, reposing of trust and confidence, reliant upon somebody for practical care. Coupled with this transaction that calls for an explanation, which we'll look at in a moment, then the stage is set. I find that quite an evocative phrase, the evidential burden then shifting to the uh, defendant to demonstrate that there is a satisfactory explanation to demonstrate that he did not abuse that relationship. So turning, if we may, then to the next slide, the nature of the relationship. Well, we've looked at that in a little more detail uh, as to the narrow band of uh, relationships that by definition mean that simply if that relationship is there, then there is immediately an irrebuttable presumption of the existence of influence, confidence, trust. The then in the wider area means that you are looking often on a case by case basis for the other participants to have to require the proof of trust and confidence. Uh, and you're going to see that reliance, dependence and vulnerability, uh, often the type of individuals who may be coming through your door, either looking at a lasting power of attorney, making a will or making a lifetime gift. So turning then, if we may, to the next slide, to look at this concept of the transaction that requires an explanation. Well, not readily explicable by the relationship of the parties. So it may be there that there's a gift of something very large in amount that's going to a stranger, the handyman, the gardener, for example, the daily help. But if we look at this in a little more detail, I think it exposes for us uh, an area of concern if we contrast that with the position uh, that existed in the uh, Nyman's case, because the reality there is the gift may well be to somebody who is well known, uh, and you might be expecting that that person will be left funds on the death of the uh, donor, but the problem is there's been this concept of I'll just accelerate my inheritance. So I think we need to be particularly careful perhaps about the fact that it's not as straightforward as simply saying that this old lady appears to be giving a lot of money to the daily help who's only been in her life for three to four to three years or so uh, and not to her children, uh, but then say oh if it's a, day, a lifetime gift going to the children that's explicable, it doesn't require an explanation. So I think we have to be careful about that. Turning, if we may, then to the next slide. So uh, I think the thing that we find that uh, appears quite often in the correspondence going as it may be in relation to a potentially impugned transaction, it is this concept of manifest disadvantage. Now, that manifest disadvantage uh, was felt not to be the correct phrase, particularly if you think about what was being looked at in the Ettridge case, because in the Ettridge case, of course, it was this issue of whether or not there could be borrowing against the matrimonial home by the husband for his business, for example. And you could then argue in those circumstances that actually it was manifestly for the advantage of the wife 
for her husband's uh, business. Uh, this is all rather sexist at the moment. It seemed to be that the husband was the entrepreneur in those cases, supposedly. Uh, um, but the reality in those circumstances is that was an element of advantage. Of course, she wanted the business to succeed and therefore uh, there wasn't the necessary manifest disadvantage. But if you widen it out to say, is it a transaction that requires an explanation? For example, in those circumstances to say, well, it did expose uh, the wife to the risk of her losing her property. You can see that actually therefore calling for an explanation in that particular circumstances was expected to be a wider catch-all definition. So, uh, however, if one can identify that the transaction does have significant disadvantages, then that will help you with your evidential aspect of your forensic tool, because you're trying to show uh, that there is a presumption of undue influence because you've identified the relationship. And secondly, you've identified that the, that the transaction calls for an explanation, potentially, uh, because we've identified it may be manifestly disadvantageous, uh, but there might be a wider consideration uh, than that also in terms of its obvious nature. Um, so, Joe, if we then turn to the next aspect. So we now have the stage set as identified in the Nyman's case. What we, uh, and in the Ettridge case, uh, we need then to think about how is it potentially and where then does the role of the solicitor come into play? Uh, we're then thinking about the situation where uh, there is advice that actually we've looked at, determined that the uh, donee does indeed have capacity, uh, a talk indeed for another day, uh, but in the course of that uh, you will have to consider also whether or not the donee uh, has been freed from any uh, potentially undue um, influence. So how can it be therefore that one could, uh, as the recipient of the gift, seek to rebut the presumption once you've got the presence of those two elements, relationship, trust and confidence, followed by the need for an explanation? Well, if there has been competent and independent advice uh, identified as long ago as in the case of Inch, Nora and Omar in 1929, then that may rebut the presumption. But it needs to have that competent and independent advice needs to, in effect, have two aspects to it in order for it potentially uh, to be of assistance in rebutting the presumption. Has there been independent and coherent advice? Uh, and we'll look at that in a moment. Was that advice, even if it was prima facie independent uh, and indeed covered all the bases in the way we're going to look at in a moment. Was it effective to free the donor from the undue influence? Because that's what you're trying to do, uh, to give your donee, remove the donee from the picture, to be able to say to the donor, this is your choice. You do not have to make the gift, but think about what are the consequences. So, first of all, important to know that actually we are now get, we're looking at this in the light of the guidance of the cases. We're looking at this on a case by case basis. It is simply not enough to say, oh, there was advice from a solicitor and that automatically should lead to a rebuttal of the presumption. Uh, and in those circumstances, we know that there's going to be a significant focus, therefore, on the quality of the advice that is given by uh, the solicitor. So if we uh, may, uh, Joe, we're going to turn now uh, to the next uh, slide. So what we have looked at is this idea that it isn't a formulaic or mechanistic approach. The fact that you say, well, there is a solicitor of X years standing who talked to the donor, query potentially in the presence of the donee, about the transaction that they were undertaking. Uh, therefore, I as the donee am able to rebut the presumption. So I think the first thing that we need to think about is what we're trying to give that, that individual is an independence of judgment and freedom, even if there are aspects of their lives in which the donee is incredibly important. So that is this concept of being able to 
in the safety of the solicitor's office, for example, and uh, within the context of the correspondence uh, that's given by way of written advice, potentially, that that creates a safe space for the individual to make the decision. Not an easy situation to create. So the first question, perhaps, I think, that arises in my mind often is, can that advice be effective where the solicitor themselves is chosen by the donee and it is not clear who is giving the instructions? Uh, and that's apparent in a, a recent case called Solis and Leyshen, where the transfer was in fact set aside. And if we look at the next slide, we'll just see uh, how it is uh, that what is trying to be created is this safe space, but the problem uh, that is then created is where you have got the daughter of the recipient of the gift who has chosen the solicitor who transpires to be friendly uh, with the daughter, uh, not a long-standing friendship, but the communication, the channels of communication go largely between daughter and solicitor as opposed to the mother. Uh, and if one thinks about that, that's a very obvious situation that we might see in the current crisis whereby people are relying upon technology <laughs> rather than uh, a visit to your office tea and sympathy biscuits in your office when you're able to feel a little bit about the vulnerability of the lay client. And you might not have, say you'll have a, an elderly lay client who's not familiar, for example, with technology, and you suddenly will be being bombarded, not only perhaps, luckily, if you have get as far as a Zoom interview, uh, but emails from uh, a, a lay individual who doesn't appear of a certain age to use email regularly in their lives. So, but what happened in the Solis case uh, was that there was simply a short uh, interview, a sole interview with the daughter who was in the waiting room. Well, the question that was asked by the judge was had that, had that intervention created a safe space, a space in which uh, the, the mother could think about the consequences of why she was gifting the house to the daughter. Did she have a choice uh, in undertaking uh, that as uh, an enterprise? So uh, I think we're going to look in a moment at the next slide just to think in a little more detail uh, about uh, the approach of the solicitor. So I think first of all, one wants to think a little bit about the quality of the advice and then we'll turn to look at the circumstances in which that advice comes to be given as to whether or not it has the emancipating effect. So first of all you've got to think about the cogent explanation of what is happening and in particular if you're looking at it's rather obvious if you're looking at a house for example no security if somebody is still living in the property, no assets to realise if you need funds. It's a wholly ineffective transaction if you're purporting if the driving force is meant to be IHT. A very real danger of deprivation of assets if, you're, if the donor subsequently needs uh, care. And I think the reality is one has to be alive to the fact that the uh, deprivation of assets and the Care Act 2014 is going to be something that again may be very carefully looked at in circumstances when there is going to be significant financial pressure uh, on uh, local authorities. And so those are the, so one's going to have to think about the disadvantages of the gift and also saying to the client that the client's decision has to be the client's own, particularly in circumstances where, as it were, the initial phone call has not come from uh, the lay client who's making the gift, but rather from the recipient. My mother needs an individual, needs assistance in making this gift. So if we could turn perhaps just to the next uh, slide, just to think a little bit um, about the uh, recent uh, cases, and in particular, uh, how the presence of uh, the solicitor's advice 
uh, either assisted or didn't assist in the transaction. And then we'll give some thought to actually what is it that we are trying to achieve in giving that advice uh, and uh, how best can we possibly go about that uh, while adhering to uh, the guidance notes and the conflict issues. So the case of um, Paul and Paul is a recent decision, in fact, by Master Bowles. And it's interesting, perhaps, because this is a transfer not by a particularly elderly individual, because he's only 67. And that has some implications of itself in reality about what you might be on alert in respect of uh, as a solicitor, uh, as and I think it falls really in a number of ways. One is of itself, one might say, well, Neville is only 67. He doesn't in those circumstances necessarily need um, quite such a such concern. It doesn't raise particularly necessarily a red light as to whether he's vulnerable, for example, by reason of old age. On the other hand, equally, should it not raise a concern that at 67, he may have another 25 years or so of life, and why therefore does he need to be making a lifetime gift of what is a fairly major asset, as we'll see in a moment in relation to um, the position. Uh, and therefore, equally, you need to be asking at a fairly early stage, well, is that individual eccentric and therefore vulnerable? Uh, and we'll look in a moment about how realistic some of these appraisals necessarily can be uh, during the currency of the time uh, that you are uh, trying to make it uh, when you are uh, treading a, a narrow line perhaps between ensuring that you're still capable of giving advice because the donee does not remove the donor from your ability uh, uh, to give advice and influence the outcome uh, and equally uh, how much is anybody be being prepared uh, to pay uh, in essence for that advice by reason of the transaction uh, so when looking retrospectively at the transaction that was that was carried out by Neville, uh, the court was able to say, well, he was a vulnerable, ex eccentric individual who'd uh, felt so uh, constrained, as it were, about his individuality that at various stages he'd felt he needed to change his name in order to stamp his individuality on his existence, um, and while and had formed a relationship with a disabled partner with whom he lived and so that as a couple uh, they were essentially particularly vulnerable. Um, now the problem we identify here is that both men attend an individual who is the conveyancing solicitor. The conveyancing solicitor sees them together twice and then perhaps rather belatedly realises that he needs to have uh, a session He's, he's so worried about it that he's written a draft letter of advice to Neville, but then everybody comes to have the transaction carried out with greater speed than perhaps the conveyance the solicitor uh, thought was appropriate. And he takes that opportunity to read a letter of advice through to Neville. Well, it may be that through the course of uh, this webinar this morning, you feel that actually listening to Miranda for 50 minutes or so uh, stretches your powers of concentration. Uh, Neville, however, uh, was obviously in a much more difficult position uh, whereby he was having read to him. And if we can just, Catherine, move to the next slide, we can see um, in a moment that he's read to for a very long time this letter. But uh, so we see here, and I just want to set the stage perhaps before we look at the content of the letter. So the house was worth 375,000. Neville still had some savings, considerable savings of his own, over a quarter of a million. So despite his vulnerability, he had amassed uh, some uh, liquid assets. Uh, but the house was still lived in by Neville and the cohabitee. The conveyancing solicitor who was instructed uh, uh, had only a charging rate of about £250 uh, that had been quoted. So again, we have this problem about what are we going to do about the cost of this. Two attendance notes, father and son present. The solicitor's view, slightly dangerously it seems to me, is that he is then, he thought he was acting for Neville alone. But in those circumstances, how come it, how comes it, you may well say, that actually he's seeing both Neville 
and his son together. But Neville didn't want to be parted from his son, whether he said, I'm hard of hearing, I have difficulty reading, you're a person in authority, I'm a bit worried about you. Um, all those difficulties about separating uh, the uh, person who's being the subject of the influence from the influencer. But the important issue before we move to look at this letter is that the solicitor had been misled uh, by his by Neville's son to the effect that the house was empty and that Neville was living with him, whereas in fact Neville was still living at the house with his domestic partner. Uh, and in essence, the problem was that Neville was complicit in misleading the solicitor. Uh, and it would be right to say that one does feel in the course of reading Master Bowles's judgment, uh, actually very sorry for the solicitor about how he was uh, expected to do um, his job uh, in those uh, circumstances. But we'll look at next, the next slide to just see about this, uh, the note. So this is about the concept then of either a written advice or the simplicity um, of an oral discussion about the disadvantages. And the pro part of the problem uh, that Master Bowles identified was that the note from the solicitor was, he said, not an easy read, a lawyer's document. Well, we've seen at the beginning uh, that actually the important thing that from was that the advice needs to come from a qualified individual but the answer is we have to think about using plain language uh, of course difficult in these circumstances if you're grappling for example with the difference between a tenancy in common or joint beneficial tenancies you're dealing with inheritance tax reservation of a ben of benefits very difficult uh, but in, in essence whilst it did go into the detail of problems, for example, local authority fees, it did not with clarity make plain that a transfer is irrevocable and that the transfer all simply cannot go back. Now that seems to be to be the absolute essence of this irrevocability of the gift, not using that word because it will have to be a simple word in those circumstances. But the fact is that once the transaction is signed, the individual is at the mercy of the donee, subject to there being very substantial uh, court proceedings in relation to it. But we can see here that Neville had the bit between his teeth. He attended and he executed the transfer. Wasn't going to be dissuaded from it. Now that might be a circumstance that some of you uh, recognize uh, that are listening to this uh, today. But the interesting aspect then in the part of what more could the solicitor have done or was this advice that created an emancipated donor the answer was in essence it was not an emancipate emancipating advice uh, because in essence uh, because the solicitor didn't know that this man was living at his, at, the ha at the house then his home he didn't tell him that the home was at risk or indeed that therefore actually happened also to him, which is irrevocable. Um, and in essence, the second part was that the circumstances in which the advice, so the advice wasn't effective because it didn't concentrate on the fact that he was losing his home and equally the circumstances in which it was given meant that he was not freed uh, from the influence. So Catherine, if we can just turn to the next slide, if we may. So, this is the important aspect that about impugning this transaction. So you may be looking retrospectively. So we know that there was a problem for this solicitor because he just didn't know what the circumstances were on the ground. Uh, and we'll come back to the questions that we might need to be asking about circumstances that you've got in front of you before you give the advice. But when you're looking at a potentially retrospective uh, challenge to the transaction. And here in Paul and Paul, Neville was challenging the transaction after the event. Uh, but you might equally be challenging the transaction on behalf of the personal representative of the Donies estate, for example. So you're looking back and saying, well, what equally, what do we got, can we identify here was a failing in that um, in, in the advice that was given, because we've got correspondence saying, well, I 
here's a beautifully drafted attendance note pointing out a large number of difficulties. But if it was predicated on a false basis, then that is, it means that it can't have been effective advice. It's a necessary, a full understanding of what was being undertaken was a necessary precondition uh, before the court can be satisfied as to the rebuttal. So uh, even if, I say that's step one effectively to say that the advice didn't cover the relevant features because of the fact that the, the donor and the donee had actually misled the solicitor. And I think that happens perhaps more often than perhaps I see, uh, but uh, for those of you uh, seeing people individually at the point in time of making the transaction, it may be a feature that you're concerned about. So it failed on that first limb. It also failed on the second limb about whether or not it could be said to have uh, the circumstances in which the advice was given, could it be said to emancipate Neville? Well, the reality is no, because his son was in on the advice the giving of the advice and of course whilst you're saying on the one hand that the transaction is cannot be undone because somebody's signing it and you probably have to put in parentheses unless the other person agrees and of course they know uh, your donor says well of course this other person will always agree because i repose trust and confidence in that person uh, and therefore i don't need to worry about all these legal formalities about the fact i can't set aside the transaction i've been assured i'll have a home for life so the reality is you can see that the very presence of the influencer seems to me to make render ineffective <laughs> Uh, the transact, the emancipating quality um, of that advice. So can we just turn uh, to the next page uh, and just have a little look at the next, the next case. So just before we do that, the transaction in Paul and Paul uh, was indeed um, set aside uh, in those uh, circumstances. And I just wanted, before we look at some of the practicalities about how we might approach things, I just wanted to look at um, a recent case, which perhaps you're going to be surprised at the temerity of Mr. Doherty, who attended even at the summary judgment hearing, uh, when you hear about the circumstances. But this is a absolutely obvious example um, of uh, elder abuse. Uh, and one has to put it as high as that, uh, not an individual um, where you've got a pre-existing uh, relationship, as it were, of uh, care of, uh, or indeed an adult child, uh, simply from their perspective, moving on their inheritance. So Morsi and Doherty is slightly unusual, but because it was a summary judgment um, application. But actually a summary judgment application in an undue influence case might be quite powerful because, of course, if you are on behalf of uh, the claimant trying to impugn a transaction and you can set up sufficiently uh, the fact that on the face of all the documentation what you have got is a relationship of trust and confidence coupled with a transaction that clearly calls for an explanation and the defendant cannot adduce at that early stage the evidence upon which they say would pertain to releasing and negating the influence from being undue, uh, then the reality is there may be circumstances in which uh, you are going to succeed in your summary judgment. Uh, and perhaps when we look at the uh, facts in a little more detail, uh, this is a, a, another uh, decision uh, by um, a master, uh, but again, uh, just an indication of the fact that uh, in the masters, in the chancery division, one's seeing now many cases actually the sub substance of which, or looking at the Neville Paul and Paul case, uh, heard trial by a master. Uh, and again, uh, here, summary judgment, so not surprisingly heard by a master, but absolutely prepared to engage with the substantive principles uh, and a method of having, as it were, an expert tribunal uh, at a relatively, uh, with some, some speed, although that process may have been slowed down uh, by the coronavirus situation. Uh, but in any event, it, it important to understand Mrs G was in poor health and what that led to subsequently uh, was in fact actually 
prior to the summary judgment hearing was the engagement, in fact, of um, Professor Jacobi, probably one of uh, his last uh, reports looking at issues of uh, undue influence in particular and vulnerability. Uh, so thinking about that, she was uh, in poor, various, uh, Poor health, uh, aged 78, sold her home to Mr. Doherty, uh, aged uh, 33. Um, Mr. Doherty uh, paid £70,000 uh, for that property. And originally, uh, the conveyancing documentation indicated he was going to grant her some sort of 10 year lease subject to it being renewed, but then that ripened into a, a full scale life interest. Um, thereafter, um, he'd claimed there was a loving relationship. Uh, Mrs. G, her part, believed in fact that they might actually marry. So you can see if ever there was a uh, relationship of trust and misplaced confidence uh, in Mr. Doherty, uh, that was uh, this in this instance. So if we could turn now to the um, next slide. Uh, so let's look at what happens with the solicitor. <laughs> two legal advisors involved from one from one firm one firm acting for both parties seemed to be a bit of a muddle in those circumstances about each time who was acting for who um, solicitors the conveyancing file didn't re reveal any really clear advice to mrs g but they got written instructions from mrs g so she was perfectly capable of writing and saying this is what she wanted to happen that she'd known the defendant for 10 years that they loved each other uh, in a in a form of a relationship plus that she needed liquid funds. And this is again, another important area for us to think about. What was not known to the poor conveyancing solicitor, albeit it might be said that the, 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 the position uh, was less well covered than in the situation of Paul and Paul. Um, so the representation was that she needed to access funds uh, quickly. But in fact, it transpired uh, on further investigation, on the retrospective investigation, which this was after Mrs. G's death, that she actually had well over £100,000 in liquid cash at that stage. So a bit of, you know, who's again, a bit of misleading going on, complicit perhaps with the influencer about making sure why I need this, why do I need to take part in this transaction? albeit regrettably without actually being able to nail where those monies went the money went subsequent to the transaction the conveyancing solicitor did get gp's report as to capacity and the capacity report also said that mrs g was not being coerced but again this common feature about misleading as to the details of the relationship and that they were in fact to live together again uh, rather odd but the problem about capacity not coerced well not actual not actual duress perhaps not actual uh, but where are we going to need to go for the um, influence well pretty clear in that trust and relationship and disastrous transaction uh, for that lady so could we just move then to the next screen so the problem again for the solicitor uh, was a false representation that she needed the liquid funds so she was prepared to accept that it was a sale at an undervalue, but with a life interest, more difficult perhaps to get on the open market than the uh, kind Mr. Doherty who'd uh, come into her life. So the advice again was not informed, not informed advice because it wasn't on the correct premise. Then also we just need to move to an interesting feature about the fact that in this instance, it was said that Mr. Doherty discovered subsequently that he had a history of fraud, including preying on the vulnerable elderly with a not dissimilar transaction in his past. And that effectively this relationship of trust and confidence, it was held that the defendant owed Mrs. G a duty of candor and fairness so that she could make an informed decision that in essence she was dealing with something of a rogue and was prepared to take a risk. Now, if we just look at the next slide for where that came from. So um, the most recent case was a court of appeal case some years ago at Hewitt and First Plus. And um, it was a very interesting case about it, effectively the relationship between a husband and wife. And if you were as the wife were being asked to guarantee your husband's debts, predicated on the basis that whilst there wasn't a guarantee that your marriage 
would continue. It was predicated on the basis that you were in a functioning marriage and that therefore he was going to be working for your joint uh, benefit. Whereas in fact, in the um, Hewitt case, Mr. Hewitt uh, was having a long-standing affair with somebody else and very shortly thereafter, uh, the marriage ended um, in a divorce. And uh, the Court of Appeal held that in order for the wife to make an informed decision about whether or not she was going to embark upon this transaction, the relationship between the two was such that there was a relationship of candor and honesty and uh, imposed a duty imposed upon the husband. Uh, and by analogy, Master Price said effectively uh, that it was necessary that uh, uh, the deceased Mrs G needed to know uh, that uh, Mr Doherty was a rogue and uh, that um, equally as a consequence of which the advice was infected uh, by the absence of that information. So very difficult situation for solicitors where the donee is prepared to twist the facts as a result of the undue influence. So turning if we may just to the next uh, slide, uh, just to have a little look at the uh, sources of guidance that we might find um, in relation to uh, these new guidance notes that have come into being and also a little bit about the conflicts of interest. Uh, so again, uh, just to be on red alert, that you will find those um, now all updated. So if we may just turn to the next slide and just have a little look at uh, some of the aspects that we think we've identified from looking at the earlier uh, and most recent case law as to what aspects that we're going to have to have particular concern about if one is the, the solicitor, as it were, potentially in the firing line being asked to advise about such a transaction, or in reality not even being asked to advise, but just facilitate the transaction. And then indeed aspects that if we are looking at whether or not we are looking to impugn that transaction or indeed to defend it, what are the considerations that we're going to need to um, think about. So the reality is that you are directed under the practice note of gift of assets to consider any possible conflict where you receive uh, instructions from the donee, uh, as a, particularly if you're already at for the donor. But this problem about conflict of interest is if you look at what it says in the SRA guidance, a situation where your separate duties to act in the best interests of two or more of the clients in the same matter, or related matter conflict. Well, I think we've begun, if you were to take one side of A4 and put disadvantages in one column for the donor and advantages for the donee in the other column, it would be very difficult to say there isn't a conflict in these circumstances where there is a large gift of something that fundamentally undermines either the housing security or the financial security of the donor. But there isn't an express prohibition that you can't act for both parties. Uh, and I think it's a genuine problem in those circumstances about how you square this circle about what we see here about the definition of the conflict uh, and what we see at the, on the next slide about the guidance in relation to the um, other aspects. So how do we go about, how do they then advise looking at this issue of the gifts? How do you advise about what is the expected aspect of your advice? So in essence, often, if you've identified a vulnerability, be it through age, be it through potentially uh, learning difficulty that you've identified, um, you're going to be looking at capacity as well. And so there'll be a crossover between the information that you need to glean. And sometimes it is easier to glean the information in relation to capacity because you're able to present it as something that needs to be necessary information to make sure that subsequently it's not challenged. So the duty though of you is more than drawing up the documentation you are expressly under making a gift of asset directed to ensure that the donor fully understands nature, effect, benefits, risks, and foreseeable consequences. How do you give that advice? Because you need to know other assets, financial circumstances, you may be rebuffed, you may be not told the correct information. What I think is helpful 
is the, this concept of drawing up a very short checklist of what are the risks. And again, they'll be on, those are what you can say are things that place you on red alert and why there are disadvantages in this transaction in very simple language as we discussed earlier. The other consequences, uh, again, may be impact on inheritance. Again, may be that you, you are the firm that drew up the will. Maybe you're able to gauge in the course of that discussion as to whether that's something somebody wants to look at, whether you need, want to, uh, and whether they're prepared to tell you how they intend to square the circle if they do between maintaining what had otherwise been equality between the siblings, why a child is being preferred, uh, uh, why a child is being disinherited and preferred to the cleaning lady, for example. So perhaps if we just move to the next uh, slide. So then again, just jumping, if I may, to another guidance note, uh, because we need to look in all of those three guidance notes to see your overriding duty is to your client. This is the vulnerable client, and you must ensure that your instructions are from your client free of undue influence. Well, a guarantee that one can't absolutely give. But the interesting thing about what that then says in the guidance notes is that if you suspect, suspect that a client's instructions are the result of undue influence or coercion, you cannot act unless you've satisfied that those instructions are the client's wishes, presumably independent wishes. Um, but again, if concerns remain, but the client wishes to continue with the transaction against their best interests, you should see them alone. Well, I think we've discussed that actually the seeing them alone, if at all possible, is something you should start with, because often otherwise, it seems to me that the solicitor becomes contaminated in, as it were, approving the transaction because they were initially prepared to see everybody together. And if you've got a cogent influencer, I think the reality is they gain status by having introduced the solicitor in those circumstances explain the consequences and get instructions preferably in writing that the individual does want to carry on with uh, that transaction. So should we just move then to the next slide if we may? So what I think we do need to think about in a little more detail here is the attendance note um, because we know as we examine attendance notes for those in the private client department, uh, that the uh, client uh, subsequently impugning a transaction, be it again, the beneficiary, the personal representative, who's disinherited effectively uh, under, by reason of the lifetime gift, your attendance note is going to be poured over. Uh, and in those circumstances, it, it has to be uh, crystal clear. Uh, and, uh, uh, and although, in reality, again, how far you are being paid for it is a different issue, uh, but it's very clear that, again, the attendance note needs to address the vulnerability uh, aspect and the steps that you took, again, because what you're trying to do is to facilitate, actually, the client, if they are hell-bent, as it were, on making the transaction, you need to be able to try and give them the breathing space uh, that we saw in the Solis case to be able to say, I have thought about this, I've taken a deep breath, I've made a decision, and this is my decision. I think the problematic thing at the very beginning is, whilst there isn't an absolute prohibition that we've seen on acting for both sides in the uh, SLA definition of conflict and indeed in making the gift, the reality is that on the ground, there is very often such a conflict that it can't be. Uh, the best interests do not ally between your two potential clients. You should in any event, it seems to me, be wary from the donor who will not be separated from the donee for the advice purposes and doesn't want to be seen alone. And then I think then the holistic approach of what is it that is the driver, again, not by asking leading questions, but in the client's own words, why do they feel that they need to make that gift now? Because of course, by introducing that as a topic of conversation, because they're worried about care home fees, you're able to say, but the reality is, what's very problematic is that this may not, this transaction now may indeed absolutely may not work. 
because you're making a gift in the face of your ill health. And it may be a transaction that's set aside uh, for the purposes of quantifying your finances. What a disaster that would be. Uh, so I think it's the attendance note, it's the red list, the, the red light disadvantages that need flagging up and query the holistic view of the client as to why they are making state why they are making the gift in those circumstances and you may be able to suggest the middle course which is that it is a gift that can still be made in a will for example uh, or indeed a modest gift because somebody's got financial problems that they want to help with um, and they're going to have you to stay for six months and you want to just help during that time so if we could just move um, on to the next slide if we were uh, might do for the moment um, i think just i wanted to say finally in relation to the practical steps what we've talked about really is also this idea this introduction about the medical report now i know perhaps it's a difficult thing uh, that we all have to grapple with about whether or not indeed a gp will write a report uh, and the fact that if it's an expensive report by a consultant a geriatrician a specialist then that's certainly something that somebody may not want to um, deal with but if you have got to worry about capacity then the reality is that actually and you've managed to persuade everybody that at very least the gp should be looking at it uh, what you may learn as the solicitor is that actually you may learn about vulnerability quite successfully because for example it may not be that short-term memory uh, is impaired but it may actually be for example that there's some that the physical day-to-day -day has become so difficult that they are reposing trust and confidence and uh, there's a measure of ascendancy by the, the, the child for example the adult child who said well I can only care for you uh, if I've got enough money to be coming to see you on a regular basis and and you can just find both the mental and physical disabilities a little better out of the capacity report uh, then we've really looked at this issue about the absolute nature of the gift um, I think a very powerful one is where will they live if there is a falling out because of course what most people want to avoid is the removal to the care home if at all possible and that may be why they've said they're moving to live uh, with their child relative whatever because the reality is they can no longer live independently uh, but actually that might have even accelerated a transfer to a care home um, and the care package that they have in their local authority may be uh, superior in those circumstances so um, if we just move to the um, last slide just to look at uh, what an unenviable uh, task what i just wanted to say i think finally about it for the mo for us before i just see if there are uh, any uh, questions at the moment which um, we could address is this issue really the problem is that it seems to be quite often the property solicitor is the first point of contact uh, and it might well be worth it seems to me being asked within the firm whether there is a referral mechanism at all within the conveyancing department to the private client department where it's apparent uh, by the conveyancer that inevitably there is dealings to be done with the vulnerable elderly and what assistance can be uh, dealt with at that stage because for example you might also is it part of a wider transaction in relation to either making a will or lasting power of attorney uh, and there definitely is in any event a legitimate role for the private client uh, solicitor uh, who is experienced i think the next thing is to ask at a really very early question say, state know who your client is and it's a question you ask of yourself in essence or, or is it that in reality you are trying to ride the two horses uh, with however uncomfortable that uh, that will be and an impossible cir circus act and so you are sure in those circumstances uh, that you know who you are giving the advice uh, to and then in any event even if it is that the advice you are giving is you've identified who your client is if at all possible you do need to see them alone uh, because it is uh, an atmosphere and and part again of the private client training will have been uh, how to make the vulnerable client whether they be elderly or not at home and not to be 
uh, the lawyer who speaks only in the language of tenancy in common and beneficial joint tenants, but is able to produce uh, to play into plain English what the problems are. And then I think the reality is the short, clear checklist of the risks, ideally for them to take home um, and think about uh, before the transaction is completed. Uh, and that can be done in a relatively short uh, letter of advice in terms of uh, covering um, all the bases, but still again, the importance being um, in plain English. Uh, so thank you very much indeed uh, for your attention today. And uh, if there are any questions, I can address them now. And if not, um, I uh, wish you a, a good lunch uh, and that today hasn't given you indigestion. But I think these are important areas that I regret after COVID-19. Uh, we are perhaps potentially uh, going to see the more of. Uh, and again, perhaps an additional unwelcome burden uh, to uh, your workload uh, already. Uh, so thank you very much. And I think at this stage, I haven't seen anything come in. Um, I perhaps will just ask uh, Catherine in those circumstances at the moment whether she can identify uh, uh, any questions um, on her screen that have come in. Uh, and so I'll just do that before I say formally goodbye. Um, so Catherine, can you see at the moment whether you've got any? Yes. Uh, I we've had one just come in, Mir Miranda. Yes. Yes, uh, so there's an interesting, very practical question. Often the donee has offered to pay our fee for advising the donor. <laughs> um, I think the answer is it does create, it immediately creates the semblance of, a, of, a com of an element of conflict. And I think the reality is that one would say, wouldn't you, and I think my answer to this is that if things are so bad in the donor's life that they cannot afford to pay you for the advice before they gift away a very substantial asset, they should not be making the gift or embarking upon the transaction. So I think my practical advice would be to say that actually for that reason, it, it raises almost, it, it raises the alarm bells. And, and they ring very loud in those circumstances. So I hope that uh, I hope that helps. Uh, but don't ah. So and I have an, another one now. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, I think really what the next uh, question deals with is, is in a sense, um, somebody at Manir Evans as a uh, as a finance deputy seeing the cases uh, where. The children of P don't understand that the money is not their inheritance, um, and uh, and that that this pressure uh, placed on the parent to enter in to um, equity release schemes, um, and uh, and I think uh, again, it's just really an illustration of the pressure uh, that comes to bear, and. Again, I can see potentially some big arguments between uh, the local authority who've become, I think, much better now at ensuring early on uh, that after the three month uh, period of grace, uh, they are embarking upon ensuring uh, that they are getting uh, a charge put on the property uh, to ensure that their care fees um, are being dealt with. But I think the fundamental problem that we still grapple with on a regular basis relates absolutely to this concept, as we saw at the beginning, uh, of an individual, uh, an individual situation <laughs> uh, where absolutely the inheritors just simply believe that it's their money during lifetime. Yes, um, well, uh, I think again, somebody's um, helped with this problem about a donor marrying, a, marrying their carer, um, having already in her will given all um, to uh, the new uh, husband. Uh, well, uh, we've got the problem again of whether or not that individual had capacity to marry. Uh, and I know uh, that there've been a number of uh, recent cases about actually uh, quite the extent of um, being able to understand. I'm, I was a great believer that actually it did involve really being able to understand uh, such things as the revocation of a will or indeed uh, implications uh, for um, 
your finances in a way that I think the High Court slightly rode back from in the most recent case in which Ruth Hughes was involved. But uh, I think you have to go back to in those circumstances as to whether or not uh, the donor has capacity. Uh, we have a problem in any event, don't we, that of course what we're not looking at once we get death, <laughs> if he hasn't managed to get it during lifetime and is reliant upon her will, we have no presumption in relation to uh, presumed undue influence in a will because it's felt by the courts uh, that from the early days of the 19th century the individual did have to leave her money or their money somewhere and so there was no such presumption. I think we're all uncomfortable but the Law Commission in looking at um, any changes to wills was not at this stage in about to embark upon uh, a uh, presumed, a doctrine of presumed undue influence uh, with any great, uh, and so we still have to grapple with that um, as a problem. So it becomes perhaps a capacity question uh, about the marriage. Um, indeed, it may be that one is able to look at the quality of the marriage and whether she's been abandoned at an early stage and put in a care home, for example, uh, and look at the inherent jurisdiction of the court, perhaps, uh, even if there is a misplaced uh, desire for, of the donor for the marriage to continue. Um, uh, and so issues about separation, for example, and or uh, divorce. So I think we've identified uh, how important this area of the law is, uh, endlessly interesting, but endlessly problematic uh, in a difficult age of people, uh, longevity uh, and financial uh, difficulty for the next generation. Uh, so I am going to say uh, goodbye now, um, but thank you very much uh, indeed for everybody um, attending. Uh, and uh, um, those of you who are able to have uh, a summer break, uh, even if it isn't on exotic uh, shores, um, I do hope um, that you're able to enjoy it. Uh, so thank you very much. Right.